Argyll was born about 1610. Initially, he was not inclined to enter the ministry, but his father entreated him to give it a serious consideration. As he prayed and fasted about this matter, Ezekiel 3, verse 1, made a deep impression upon him, and he began his studies. This very scripture happened to be assigned to him by the presbytery during his trial for ordination. He resolved then to become thoroughly acquainted with the inspired word that he might speak with power to God's people. In 1660, a large number of people came to hear him, expecting that he would speak well of the restoration of King Charles. He did just the opposite. The wrath of the malignants was soon upon him. He was locked out of his church and declared an outlaw. He had some miraculous escapes from his persecutors and continued preaching in the fields. At one conventicle after the death of Richard Cameron, Cargill declared an excommunication upon the king. A large reward was offered for his capture, and the deed was done. At the hangman's scaffold, he sang some verses of Psalm 118 and told the motley throng about the certainty of his interest in the everlasting covenant. His last words were, Farewell, all relatives and friends in Christ. Farewell, acquaintances and earthly enjoyments. Farewell, reading and preaching, praying and believing, wanderings, reproach and sufferings. Welcome, Father, Son and Holy Ghost, into thy hands I commit my spirit. This sermon is on the text of Hebrews 13, verse 14 which is, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. In vain would we hope to bring men to a course of godliness, considering how averse the flesh is to it. And in vain would we deal with ourselves for that purpose, if great and real advantage lay not in taking that way. Whatever the flesh objects as to disadvantage, yet there is no real disadvantage in a religious life. Yea, there is more advantage in this course than will make up for all other disadvantages. It were good that we were considering what advantages there are in this way and comparing our advantages with our disadvantages. It would gain our affections to it, considering that the Lord is calling us to leave all that which at last will prove our eternal ruin. As for anything lawful, he is not calling us to leave that, but we are not to be, uh, not to idolize or make a God, as it were, of it. Consider what he is calling us to pursue. It is that without which we cannot be eternally happy. Now, this is the scope of the words. The apostle is here pressing that exhortation which he was giving in the 13th verse says he, let us therefore go to him without the camp, bearing his reproach. But this seems heavy, and therefore he puts in this reason on the text. For here we have no continuing city. In these words we have first the shortness of man's life signified. It is here compared to a city. In opposition to the present life, Paul sets forth the length of eternity but we seek one to come. Secondly, there is the employment of those that leave it. How are they taken up? They are as travelers going from one place unto another until they at last come to their long abode or resting place, which is heaven. Now the words hold forth these few things unto us. First, that man's continuance on earth and enjoyments of earthly things are but for a short time. And second, that the consideration of this short time on earth should take our hearts off from earthly things and set them upon Christ only. And third, that we must all flit and remove from this earth, for here we have no continuing city. Fourth, that all should be seeking after Christ and that city or eternal habitation of rest. <clears throat> now, we shall speak to some of these. The first thing which we proposed to speak unto 
was that man has but a short time or lease on earth. The Spirit of God points it out by sundry expressions. Lord, make me know mine end and the measure of my days. And what is the answer? Behold, thou hast made my days as an hand breadth, ye shorter, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Says Moses when speaking of man's life, they are like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass that groweth up, and in the evening it is cut down and withereth. Our days are but as a thought. Nay, the Holy Ghost points them out to be shorter. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth a little and then vanisheth away. It is rather a vapor than a reality. It is but a vapor that continueth a little time. And doth not experience prove all this? Are we not here today and away tomorrow? The great thing we ought to consider is that our time here is but short, a truth seldom minded and more seldom laid to heart. First use of this. If our time here be short, it ought to be <clears throat> the better employed. It should make us early up in the morning and late up at night about our main work. It becomes us first to consider our ways and what belongs to our peace. It is a good advice that Solomon gives us. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth before the evil days come. And yet the most part of us, for all that is spoken from the word of the Lord concerning the shortness of man's life, think not that our time is short, but long enough. And so remember not that the evil days are coming upon us. Second, we lie down and know not if we ever shall rise up again. Should we not then improve our time? For is there any person so certain of his life that he can say, I shall live so long? And it is not of God's good providence that it is so short and so uncertain unto us. Third, consider that it is not only short and uncertain, but also full of trouble and misery. And is it not enough for every person? What is dying and a decaying old age but labor and misery? And should not this be considered and laid to heart that our life is not only short and uncertain, but full of misery. And should not the time we now have be well employed on that account? Fourth, to incite you to employ your time. Consider that the time is short and the task is great. Are there not many strongholds of sin and corruption to subdue and conquer? Hath not man a little world to subdue in his own heart? Now lay these two together, that your time is short and your work great, and this may make you, us employ and improve it to the best advantage. Fifth, to provoke you to a right improving of time, consider further that there is nothing of greater moment or, con- or concernment than in, in eternity, an eternity of happiness or an eternity of misery. It were good for us that we were considering this and laying the preciousness of the soul in the balance with all earthly things that we might see which of them is of most value. For as our Lord says, what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Sixth, consider that eternity is fast approaching and our Lord Jesus is coming to judgment. His last words were, Surely I come quickly. And is Christ hastening? Should not every believer then be hastening to meet him? If believers loved Christ as well as he loves them, they would be more hasty to meet him. It is a wonder to see see what we are employed in and yet never employing our time right. Lastly, consider that the bridegroom is coming. And the bride must be prepared. It ought to be all our work or talk here to be ready to meet him. That we may not be found unprepared. Oh, what a dreadful thing it will be to be found unprepared when Christ comes. When the midnight cry is made, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. 
The second use, that we may further incite you to a right employing or improving of time, consider the advantages that those who rightly employ their time have. First, they have this advantage that it keeps them from many challenges of consciences, of conscience that we otherwise might have. Oh, but those who employ their time right have much peace. There are, uh, there are much comfort and good spoken to them. Indeed, there are none that have such a peaceable outgate as the man who is still preparing and looking for it. But secondly, it hath this advantage that it makes them have a clear and comfortable outgate when they enter into eternity, when about to launch out of time. You have nothing in that case to do but to step into your master's house. And oh, what sad thoughts they will have who have employed their time otherwise. And thirdly, it hath this advantage also that all his refreshments are sweet who employs his time aright. His sleep is sweet, his waking is sweet, and all is sweet. The wise man says that the rest of a laboring man is sweet, but especially when he has been about his master's work. Now, we shall give you some directions how you may employ your time aright. First, you ought to divide your work into tasks, setting so many hours apart for hearing, so many for reading, praying, meditating, etc., and so many for your regular or your ordinary calling. It would be an excellent thing if we were tasking ourselves and saying, such a thing we resolve to do and such a thing we must do. Oh, but this would make a Christian's work sweet to him. Second, you should employ your time well. You must have much heavenly and sweet prayer. With the psalmist, Lord, make me know my end. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. If this were our main care and principal petition, there would not be so much misspent time amongst us as there is. And third, in the morning when we arise, we should be thinking upon our last end. And in the evening, we should take an account how we have spent the day and then be mourning over what we have done amiss therein. The third use, we should not be troubling our thoughts with vain prospects. Are there not many who have projected things for 20 years thence, and who knows if they shall live so long? But it were good for us that we were employing our time and casting off vain and foolish prospects. The Apostle James speaks well to this. Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we shall will go into such a city and continue there a year, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. If we would consider the shortness of our time, we would think the care of every day enough for itself. This is a burdening of ourselves with unnecessary cares, adding a load to a burden. Are not the cares of a day sufficient for itself? Why then do we care for tomorrow or for many days hence? And further, you should consider that those unnecessary cares put the heart out of frame. They indispose the heart so that we cannot get our time so well spent as we ought. Nor do they only indispose for duty. But duties are jostled out, and these things that are at hand are put far off, and these things that are afar off are brought near. You know far off thoughts put death and eternity off out of mind. And are there not many who, when they put death, judgment, and eternity far out of mind, are suddenly surprised by them? Now consider, which of these are most necessary? And having found that it with that which is most necessary, let your thoughts be employed about it. Use number four. That the consideration of this shortness of our time should not only take off our hearts from earthly things, but it should even help to mitigate the cross and help to render it more easy that we may suffer more contentedly. Our longest afflictions must be, as it were, but for a moment, since our time is but as a moment and shall shortly be at an end. And consider that even whilst we are eating, drinking, sleeping, etc., our time is fast elapsing 
and our crosses and afflictions ere long shall be ended. We speak this to believers, but for unbelievers, however bad their crosses may be, it were better for them that they were thus continued and lengthened out to them through all eternity. At death, they emerge out of one woe only to enter into a greater woe and misery. But death to believers is an entrance into eternal happiness and they ought to be more earnestly longing for it as the hireling for the end of the day. It is strange that there is any intermission of afflictions in our moments of time for a cross abides not always. Still, there is some intermission of it. Thence our life is compared to a weaver's shuttle, slips through many threads in a little time, and so steals away unperceived or insensibly. Consider that though you be under many crosses or afflictions, yet if believers, you shall be freed from them all by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ shall make up all your hardships. You shall shortly arrive at rest and rest unto them that are weary. Oh, how sweet it is. And a sweet rest it is for those who are seeking after him. But those who mind not Christ have nothing to do with this rest that remaineth for the people of God. But, O oh, believer, in thy Father's house are many mansions. Thou mayest well be straightened here, but there are no straightening circumstances there. Is our life short? Then it becomes us to be moderate in all things, even in the use of all lawful enjoyments. The Apostle inculcates this. The time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as they that have none, and they that weep as though they weep not, and they that use this world as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world that passeth away becomes us to be taking our hearts off from all earthly things and studying to be weaned from them. For what are they? They are as nothing. It is strange that we who seek after other things should be so taken up with such frivolous things. But those who weep for Christ's presence shall be made to rejoice. Now for directions. How to get your hearts taken off from earthly things. Take these two things. First, do not bestow too much of your time upon those things that are of a perishing nature. It is strange to see even believers so much taken up with the world and with the cares of this life. This eats out the comfort of the soul. And where there is very much of this, there cannot be much prosperity in true godliness. And where there is much real godliness, there cannot be much of this. These two being inconsistent with one another. We cannot serve God and mammon, for as the thoughts of one rise up, the other goes down. Is it not strange that we should be so much taken up with these things? The Apostle gives it as a mark of those that perish. They that will be rich fall into many temptations and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Second, if thou wouldst have thy thoughts weaned from the world, as thou shouldst. Let it have little of thy time, so give it little of thy affections. If believers were doing this, they would be more cheerful, and he that is most cheerful in going about duty is most taken up with this city. We seek one. We seek for one to come. And consider what a stir it would make if Christ should come and take these things away, and if our mountain were moved. Think what you would do if put to difficulties. Indeed, it would be better if this world had none of our affections. This doctrine reproves those who cast away all thoughts of employing their time aright and whose consciences tell them not of their misspending of time. It is the Apostle's direction, see that ye walk not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. There are few of us but would have our bygone time to take in again and redeem. In the short time we have to live, we ought to be as travelers who have sat their time till the day be far spent and are obliged to run 
more in one hour than in three before. Finally, and from this world, and from this we would pose you, are you ready to meet Christ and ready for eternity? Have you nothing to do but to come and meet Him? We say, are you ready to step into eternity? Well, if it be not so, you have need to be serious in time. For we are not sure of another day or another sermon. Consider eternity. Will come once, and if ye spend not your time well, it will be ill with you. Take the apostles' advice. Walk while ye have the day. Hath God given you a day? Then you should be serious in it. For if we, for we walk not if we shall have another And is it not a mercy that we are not lying in the bosom of the earth, unprepared and unconverted? If you misspend this time, then wrath will come upon you. On the whole, these words are a direction to you to consider the time is passing on, and ere long we must all away. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek for one to come. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780 780- Four five zero thirty seven thirty by fax at seven eight zero four six eight ten ninety six or by mail at forty seven ten dash thirty seven A Avenue Edmonton that's E D M O N T O N Alberta abbreviated capital A capital B Canada T six L three T five you may also request a free printed catalog and remember that John Calvin in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important. When he says that God had commanded no such thing, and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.